But I still struggle with the statement of faith. It plays out in churches in a way that I don't like, that I think sometimes hurts those congregations. What I want to imagine is a Christianity where you, you can hold both sets of people, right? The yeah. people like the like this meaning crisis, all of these meaning crisis people like me, I think more people, if they gave more thought, would probably be more uncomfortable with the statement of faith. Like if you really gave it a lot of thought, it's like Jordan Peterson says, like, like this is a big thing to believe. Do statements of faith try to answer too much? I came across this video from Paul Vanderclay while collecting my thoughts on mere Christianity and thought, what a great opportunity. Here is a clear example of the struggle people are feeling in the meaning crisis. In mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis goes through many of the claims common to Christian groups. Then he goes through explanations and arguments for them, building up a Christian way of life. Fundamental to Christianity is not a list of beliefs. Right. Christianity is a life. Right. It's a way of living and being. Faith statements no longer work for some people. Six people are leaving the church right now for every one that joins. For the church, when people leave, it's a problem. But wouldn't we say it's a problem if your children never leave the family home? This just might mean people are asking different questions elsewhere, growing and developing outside of faith statements. Are we finding meaning in exploring questions instead of declaring statements? Could there be a version of Christianity in which the statement of faith is de-emphasized? or that is more like Judaism, which is about practice and stories, sacred stories and practice, and not about the statements of what we think happened, right? Instead of focusing on the word faith, what happens if we question the word statement? People never spend enough time getting the question right. Can a spiritual community encourage a love of inquiry instead of obedience through faith statements? So let's look at four statements of faith from mere Christianity and then apply some ideas from Jordan Peterson. Let's walk those claims back a bit and see if we can find better questions. Statement one, there is a mind behind the universe. Creation was a miracle made by a mind, according to church language and C.S. Lewis, something from nothing. But in modern language, potential forms something from nothing without a mind, or at least nothing resembling a human mind. If anything, the modern mind imagines a mystery and not a mind. So what can we do to bridge the gap between statements of faith that declare there is a mind behind the universe and questions of how to approach a mystery? A Chesterton quote shows this difference in mindsets. It is really far more logical to start by saying, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Even if you only mean, in the beginning, some unthinkable power began some unthinkable process. For God is by its nature a name of mystery. And nobody ever supposed that man could imagine how a world was created any more than he could create one. Whenever I first read this passage, I couldn't help but wonder, well, why not stop using the more traditional word God then? and just use the word mystery. Is there not a valuable spiritual lesson from admitting to mystery instead of assuming a mind? Whatever assumptions and whatever power you wield from using the word God, it is far more logical and far more honest to say mystery rather than use a word like God. Can we try that as a community? Reverend Greta Vosper in the Toronto area put a moratorium on the word God in her services because she no longer wanted to send that message of a sky daddy, a magical mind in the clouds. Vosper and her congregation went out looking for different metaphors, better ways of talking about these mysteries. So it is possible to experiment. Jordan Peterson talks a lot about how we face the unknown. When we face mystery, we can quickly populate it with monsters and mountains and molehills and magic and minds. That's the imagination at work, building up hypothesis upon hypothesis, all attempts to make sense or put sense into the scary, wondrous void of the unknown. We're just at this inflection point. I, I don't know what comes next. According to Peterson, what is the proper attitude toward the unknown? Curiosity expressed in hope 
excitement, and above all, in creative, exploratory behavior. To that aspect of the human being that's both exploratory and creative. Exploratory work and creative work. Such that the unknown is transformed from something terrifying and compelling into something beneficial. An asking mindset. A seeking mindset. Not a statement mindset. So, what is more honest? What is more humble? God did it, and God must have a mind. Or, this is a mystery, and inspires my curiosity. Now, what would happen if a spiritual community, even for one day, as an experiment, replaced the word God with a word like mystery? Would the religious tradition lose any power? Would people today be more willing to enter a church if they were going to learn how to have a proper relationship with mystery? as much as have a relationship with a supernatural mind. The Peterson lectures were so compelling, partly because with priests and ministers, I always feel like they're trying to get me over that line. Right? <laughs> you know? And he wasn't trying to get me over any line, right? He wasn't trying to get me over any line. He was just trying to get me to think about this stuff. And, and there, was a, there was an exploratory nature to that and you felt like you were accepting the call to adventure with yep. Peterson, yep. right? Yep. Wouldn't the proper relationship to mystery involve an asking mindset rather than a statement mindset? Instead of a statement of faith, then, what happens to us when we pose a question? What is the ideal attitude toward mystery or the unknown? Statement two, Christ's life was a real historical event and Christ is divine, as in God incarnated into person-like human form. In 1919, the New York Times sent a sports reporter to get a story about Albert Einstein's ideas on relativity. The reporter wrote an intriguing statement in the article that no more than 12 people in the world would understand relativity. The sports reporter was not a science reporter, and he was no historian, either. Let's compare this to a gospel writer. After the birth and death of Jesus, there may have only been 12 people, metaphorically, who understood what really happened. But at the time, was history writing separate, special, and different from story or myth or narrative? I'm resistant to this idea that there's an answer that is provided by an external entity, right? And it comes down from on high and, and we're supposed to accept that answer. And, and I see the value in that as well, but... We're talking about some pretty abstract stuff here. The transition from poetry to prose. The separation from a word and a thing. From a narrative style coherent to abstract patterns to a more analytical style corresponding to material events. From internal memory and oral traditions to external memory and written documents. It's not like language cares, you know. There's no separate grammar for history and then another separate grammar for myth. How would a gospel writer want to make a connection with the audience 2,000 years ago? Those writers would have to blend both mythological stories and historical events just to make sense of things and make a connection with the audience. We're still doing this today. There is something unique about the gospel writing, but there were chances for gospel writers to record, let's say, factual descriptions of events that took place, but they sometimes chose to be poetic instead, tying events and symbols to older patterns in older stories. So what do we do if we want the power of fact and historical event instead of the humility of an abstract poetic idea? Well, according to Lewis, mere Christians might say, We believe that the death of Christ is just that point in history at which something absolutely unimaginable from outside shows through into our own world. Almost every mythological story prepares the audience for the unimaginable. And yet Lewis and Chesterton and Christians seem to need a statement linking the historical and the unimaginable together as one in Jesus Christ. Jordan Peterson is having a heck of a time with this very point. He's really sorting out for himself what it would mean if the metaphorical and the literal touch. Sometimes the objective world and the narrative world touch. You know, that's Jungian synchronicity. 
And I've seen that many times in my own life. And so in some sense, I believe it's undeniable. You know, we have a narrative sense of the world. For me, that's been the world of morality. That's the world that tells us how to act. It's real, like we treat it like it's real. It's not the objective world, but the narrative and the objective world touch. And the ultimate example of that in principle is supposed to be Christ. But I don't know what to, and that seems to me oddly plausible. Yeah. Well, but I still don't know what to make of it. It's too, it, partly because it's too terrifying a reality to fully believe. I don't even know what would happen to you if you fully believed it. Some Christians may lean towards the more metaphorical understanding. Some Christians may go full metal literal. Okay, fair enough. Instead of statements, let's walk this back to questions. How do we know if or when the abstract metaphorical and the physical material touch? It's not like we have two different grammars, one for fiction and one for fact. Language doesn't care. The human imagination doesn't always seem to care either. And that's a real problem. One of the great spiritual lessons taught through the ages is thou art that. Is this an opportunity to tie the life of such a built up character like Jesus to the life of the individual in the here and now? No matter what we do, stories and words are in the abstract. We can twist ourselves into knots trying to convince ourselves that words are corresponding directly to actual historical events, but you are using words to convince yourself about more words. And worse, that is striving for pride and power over words and over people. Instead, thou art that. You are the being that has the opportunity to be the very point where the abstract metaphorical and the physical material touch. You are a living miracle. If the story of Jesus helps inspire the miracle in you, then you are living a miracle. If some other story brings others to live as though the abstract metaphorical ideal and the physical material event touch, why get stuck in the power game of making others in your image? What do we do with this figure on the cross and all other figures we put up on the cross? The statement of faith, it seems to me, is used often in an anti-Girardian way, right? It's used in a way to, to, to emphasize difference, right? And to say, we're the good and they're the bad. Lewis gives us a challenge. Lewis insists we cannot just call Jesus a moral teacher. Jesus doesn't give us that choice because of the claims the gospel writers have him say. Decide, is he a lunatic or a liar? or Lord? Or is he just a legend? Here is a challenge for today. How do we respect the role of the imagination in the medium of writing? I'm tempted to add yet another option to that list. I want to turn that exclusive or from Lewis into a more inclusive or. Jesus, the story and figure we have from language, may very well be a lunatic, liar, Lord, and legend all at once. So many of our hero characters seem to combine these very characteristics after all. There is something else here too, and I'm going to turn to Shakespeare for this one, a master of the written word. Shakespeare wrote histories that are anything but histories. They are dramas. It is possible to read Jesus as a lunatic and a lover and a poet. A lunatic, a lover, and a poet. All of imagination, all compact. The poet's pen, and not the historian's pen, turns things unknown into shapes and names. Shall we be led by lunacy or love? Or the poet's pen, all at once? My immortal beloved, shall we marry opposites, like the physical historical material with the abstract metaphorical imaginative? I ask you, a statement of faith or a question for being? Which one seeks the humble path? And so in this experiment, turning a statement into a question, we get, what is the ideal way of being so that the abstract metaphorical world and the physical material world come together in my life? Statement three, there is such a thing as a human soul and it is immortal. 
When I read through this point from Lewis about the Christian immortal soul, I wondered what was science doing today about extending life. And sure enough, lots of people are working on it. One article I found even mentioned something about studying the effects of taking blood from young people and giving infusions to older people to see if it was an effective way to boost health and prolong life. Thanks, technology. Thanks, imagination. You're going to make vampires. You're going to make billionaire vampires clutching at life because they haven't made peace with their mortal coil. If some rich billionaire decides to take infusions of young, healthy blood for the sake of extending his or her personal life, we have a real-life vampire situation on our hands. I'm not sure we're there yet, right? Like, We are going to find the technology to do this. So we are going to sacrifice young virgins, let's say, so that the old can live forever and ever. Instead of the rich having to work hard on their virtues, they can just make the world hell for those serving them. We live at the sufferance of others, and if we are not fully prepared for the consequences of that, we could become our own monsters over time. This is one of the scariest things I've ever imagined, partly because I can see it becoming so very real. Lewis discusses the consequences of immortality for an individual, and that really struck home for me. For Lewis, any personal vice or character flaw over an expanded timeline will grow monstrous. Any little thing wrong with your character means big trouble, big conflict for an immortal. You have not done the dishes for five years. Like I'm so embarrassed when people come over here. Well, what does it matter? You bring them over, you kill them! Vampires don't do dishes. Just ask Jordan Peterson. Any speck of resentment can build up a whole story or ideology or hardened heart, creating a living hell for individual and everyone in their family or community. Ordinary men, when pressed to be loyal, become obedient monsters. I may have to side with another character from the poet Bard here. What a piece of work is man. How noble in reason, how infinite in faculty, in form, in moving, how express and admirable, in action, how like an angel, in apprehension, how like a god. The beauty of the world, the paragon of animals, and yet, to me, what is this quintessence of dust? We may need to make peace with the dirt at our roots, and make room for ourselves in the layers of nature and death to pass the ultimate tests of virtue and the tests of our imagination. Now, some wisdom traditions may try to suggest that immortality does not mean forever, but outside time and space. All the galaxies are stay. Whatever the soul is, an abstraction of the imagination, or an immaterial spirit, it exists in some way outside time and space, more important than time and space. Now I do find myself asking, what courage would I need to stand and face death, knowing my soul is only something imaginative and abstract, and still aim my life at the ideal without any reward of immortality? Can I bury my pride and stoop low enough, like I am one with some clod of dirt? Often enough, the Sunday school version of Christianity becomes the default level of Christianity for the adult congregation. I still don't understand how I could come out of 12 years of Catholic school and not know who René Girard is. Like, those seem like very important ideas to contend with. And, and, I, I, and, and they, they offer an opportunity for this integration, right? That, that I think we're, we, so many people need right now. I, I, I want more people to go through that. If the soul is just an immaterial abstraction, then can it still be compelling enough to inspire a commitment to living well and aiming at an ideal, as Peterson might say? Jordan Peterson's 12 rules for life are in some ways abstract guidelines for how to set and aim your thoughts, words, emotions, and actions so they stand the tests of time and space even if we are human and mortal. Tell the truth, or at least don't lie. Every time you do this, perhaps, you are taking yourself out of time and space and committing to something greater. You are aiming your being at that point where the abstract, imaginative, metaphorical, touches the physical, historical material in the here and now. Maybe this isn't as satisfying as saying you're going to live forever. But if the soul is immaterial, 
then why not just say it is an abstraction that helps make sense of things we experience? Would it break the old traditions and practices and power of the church? Well, the play's the thing. From swords to plowshares again. From statements on the soul to questions for being. How can we transcend the tests of time and space with our thoughts, words, emotions, and actions? Statement four. Christianity prepares people to be new people, transcending totalitarianism and individualism and mere obedience. Through Christian practice and temperance, people become more human than human. One passage earlier in Mere Christianity helps describe this. We might think that God wanted simply obedience to a set of rules, whereas he really wants people of a particular sort. Christianity is not just a set of rules, but also a toolbox for continual self-correction and self-renewal. Does the church encourage and develop this new man or new people? Obviously, each person's experience will be unique. Because I walk with people as they go through transformations. Yes. And everybody in the community is going to bring their own idiosyncratic thing. But again, as a leader in a community, as someone who is, let's say, ordained, as a, who's a pastor, so as a shepherd, I walk with people in transformations. And sometimes those transformations are out of the church. Sometimes those yes. transformations are into the church. Yes. It's part of the reason of my estuary project that I'm involved with. Today, the church doesn't have a reputation as the place for personal growth and change. People are just as likely to seek out psychological help rather than spiritual help in dealing with transformation or trauma. A single therapist may inspire more change in people than a network of obedient churches. If this God Lewis describes does not want our obedience, then what does the church want from us with committed attendance and steady offerings and assumed obedience. Is it that much of a surprise that people might seek transformation outside the institution? But exactly. not everybody sees like you see. The modern world is a place of constant change. New information hits us wave after wave, day after day. But often enough, it seems the church is very slow to accept and manage new information. Culture is moving so quickly that there's a sense in which if culture moves too quickly for a bell curve group of people to sort of keep up with it, yeah. then you wind up just with with incoherence. Fragmentation, just right. In infinite fragmentation. There's a lesson from Abraham and Isaac about new information. Abraham proved even when he had the knife to his son's throat, even in the moment of highest conviction and obedience to his Lord, Abraham could change his mind. Can the church do that? The, the congregation as it exists would split. I'm drawn back to something from Lewis, where he compares Christianity not to a community and not to a family. He uses the illustration of an organism. Christianity thinks of human individuals not as mere members of a group or items in a list, but as organs in a body, different from one another and each contributing what no other could. When you find yourself wanting to turn your children or pupils or even your neighbors into people exactly like yourself, remember that God probably never meant them to be that. You and they are different organs intended to do different things. On the other hand, when you are tempted not to bother about someone else's troubles because they are no business of yours, remember that though he is different from you, he is part of the same organism as you. If you forget that he belongs to the same organism as yourself, you will become an individualist. If you forget that he is a different organ from you, if you want to suppress differences and make people all alike, you will become a totalitarian. But a Christian must not be either a totalitarian or an individualist. My curiosity was awakened by this because he does not go to a family illustration. Instead, it's an organism. A member of a community is not the same as a member of a family and not the same as an organ in an organism. An organism assumes or acts as though each organ will stay inside the organism. This sounds like the assumption of the church, too, but that isn't happening. Six members can walk away from a church, but one organ can't walk in or out of its organism. We cannot have a child and say, my daughter is just one of my organs. Even if you say that figuratively, 
People will look at you sideways. I want my children to be able to belong to a, yes. something greater than their family. Yes. Here's another curious point. Lewis does not use the word daughter in mere Christianity. Not once. This means in the most fundamental aspects of what Lewis understands as mere Christianity, the word daughter is not worth mentioning. No aspect of Christianity or God addresses the role of a daughter in the Christian family. The daughter is an absent presence. No wisdom in the form of a daughter of God in the merest of mere Christianity? That's, that, that makes no sense. In his biblical series, Peterson surprised me too when he talked about the story of Abraham and Isaac. He seemed to go back to obedience to God, loyalty, conviction, follow God completely, even if it means sacrificing your child. And there are good reasons for doing this. You have a moral obligation as a parent to encourage your child to go out into the world, right? And to be whoever they can be, to be the best they can possibly be. And in doing that, you're, offer, you're encouraging them to pursue the good. You're sacrificing them to the good. You're not keeping them for yourself selfishly. You're telling them that they can go out and live their life and live it properly. You can't hide your child from the world forever. You can't use your child to serve your ego. That's bad parenting. You have to watch as your children grow up in a family and then leave. But apparently not so in the organism of a church. According to his biblical lecture, there is no angel messenger with new information for Peterson. Peterson never asks, what is the role of the angel messenger with new information? And it is that presence of new information that is a real test. This totally lines up with his message about Cain and what he's trying to say about Genesis overall. Well, I don't exactly know what to do now. <laughs> because that... <laughs> If we go back to the words of Lewis, the God in that story is not looking for obedience and loyalty. Then what is the test? Is that the question rather than some statement? Sometimes the thing you must sacrifice is not your child, but your sense of righteousness itself. Can you sacrifice your ego and accept new information, a different perspective? and change your mind when a better way presents itself. Cain couldn't do that. Not even God changed Cain's mind. But Abraham, filled with fear and trembling, had the power to change his mind at the mere touch of a quiet voice at his shoulder, a single finger pointing to a better way, a heightened understanding of sacrifice in the abstract. Can you accept the invitation out of conviction and into transformation? Can you change your mind and ask a question, even when you have the knife raised to someone's throat? What kind of temperance do you need in your personality so that when you are blazing hot with anger, so convinced that you are right, you would still listen to a little angel by your side, pointing to another way? God is often clothed in the Christian imagination as a father figure, someone setting rules to obey, a family image, but imagine a little figure beside that father, some part of his family that has the power to change the mind of God with delight and wonder. That's a different transformation. The temperance and open mind a parent might share with a daughter. Mommy told me to come and save you. Good job. I'm saved. If a Christian must not be either totalitarian or individualist, according to Lewis, then I believe the Christian must find some aspect of Christianity that makes room for the divinity of the role of the daughter. This is a turn away from the organism metaphor from Lewis, making the family metaphor whole and allowing for developmental transformations out of childish ways. Wisdom may be implicit in many denominations, but it is certainly not explicit. And this could be an opportunity to retrieve old wisdom practices. Lady Wisdom is all too often portrayed as an older female character with advice, and not the daughter playing in the garden. We plant 
and groom and manage that garden so that our daughter will have shade in her lifetime, even if we don't in ours. We don't tend the garden so that it will taste our daughter's blood as it drips from our sacrificial knife. Part of my loyalty and wonder goes to Sophia, the daughter in the family, because she quietly points to another way. And yet what church will say in a service, God is our daughter. The next church hasn't been born yet. When will we walk into a church, your church or any church and hear God is our daughter and see the nodding of heads as though the congregation understands what that means and is open to the implications in this. I am asking questions in the spirit of inquiry, not declaring statements in the spirit of righteousness. Well, George Kelly, way back in like 1955, noted that what human beings like more than anything else, really, when you get right down to it, is to be right. Why? If we are going to tame the imperialist and tyrannical and complacent and obedient impulses within us and become new people, we may have to become like new parents, holding our daughter for the very first time. Or else we may hold her for the last time. We have to find some symbolic understanding of the role of daughter as an ideal, as part of an ideal, and work out stories that concentrate on the father-daughter relationship as an aspect of this God, whatever mystery that word means to you. No, I can't solve this. You know, this isn't, this is something a community, a, a, and a community won't solve it by writing books. A community right. will, will, will manifest progress by its being and in its practice. If we turn statements into questions, like swords into plowshares, we might harvest something very new. We could find crops of meaning from the fallow field left behind after the meaning crisis. The last conversion then, from a statement to a question. How do we best prepare ourselves to have courage and temperance when new information calls for transformation? Conviction and conflict and confident statements do not point the way ahead. The way ahead remains connection, sharing questions, taking up responsibilities, and listening for quiet voices. Cheers. I love you 3,000.